thank you very much, Cindy. G'day, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be back here for the 2008 Leadership Conference. See some familiar, some familiar faces. And uh, it's just great to be a part of such an exciting event for, to, to kick it off for 2008. In 1839, 53 Africans aboard the slave ship La Amistad were headed for Cuba. They decided that they were going to mutiny against their captors, killing all of the sailors on the ship except for two, who they were going to keep alive to sail them back to Africa, back to their homeland, and back to freedom. Unfortunately for them, their captors tricked them, and instead of sailing them back to Africa, they sailed them up the coast of the United States, where they were intercepted off the coast of New England by a U.S. naval ship. Those slaves were subsequently charged with murder and with treason. And the clip that you're about to see is of ex-president John Quincy Adams having a conversation with a former slave, a black abolitionist, Theodore Johnson. Ultimately, the fate of these slaves are going to be in the hands of these two men as they struggle to keep them alive in a court of law. Sir. Yeah? Mr. President, if it was you handling the case. Well, it is me. Thank God for that. <laughs> Lawyers have understood from the beginning of time the importance of story. When they want to connect with a judge, when they want to connect with the jury, when they want to connect with the people who ultimately have the fate of their clients' and, uh, lives in their hands, what do they tell? They know that the best story wins. Think of some modern day examples. If the glove fits, you must acquit a case where the best story won. More recently, Michael Jackson, his lawyers told a fantastic story, a case where the best story won. You know, as individuals, you too live in story. You may never thought about it in that way before. I do live in story. Yeah, you do. You live in story. It's, it's the framework, the filter in which you view the world. What is your story made up of? Uh, it, it's your family history. It's, uh, it's your, uh, your religious values, your value system. Uh, it's why you make the decisions do you make every single day. You want to know why you make the decisions you make? Look back in your, in your history. It's your story. Uh, and just like individuals have stories, so too companies have stories. Two years ago, Corporate Business was doing an event for GE down in New York City. The Sales and Leadership Forum down in, in New York City for GE. Uh, we asked them a question. We asked them, how important is the GE story to their success? And I'll ask you the same question today. How important is the ADP story to your personal success here at ADP? How important is the ADP story to the DM success when they're out in the field, interfacing with customers day to day? Well, at the GE event down in New York City, there was a man standing in the back of the room and he put his hand up and he yelled, it's our life blood. Now that's a man who understands the power of story. It's your life blood. Now imagine you had an opportunity to go on national TV, 15 minutes in the national spotlight, Sunday night on 60 minutes. Think about what that would be worth to you, just in brand recognition, brand exposure. If you had to pay for 15 minutes on national TV, how much money would you have to pay? I mean, incredible opportunity. And there was a company in the 90s who had that exact opportunity. That company was Razorfish. Razorfish, one of the most successful web startups on the internet. They had 15 minutes to be able to tell their story. Let's listen to how they did. It's here that Jeff and Craig launched Razorfish, which is now worth $4 billion. One of the most successful companies on the web. Successful at what? Good question. We've asked our clients to recontextualize their business. We've re recontextualized what it is to be a services business. You know, there, there are people out there, such as myself, who have trouble with the word recontextualize. When you're thinking about that interview, it, it just happens to be top of mind as you're driving to work on Monday morning, and, and you think to yourself, wow. I'm going to recontextualize the world. He had four opportunities, four opportunities to tell his story. 
The interview gave me four chances to get it right. Possibly the worst elevator pitch you've ever heard in your life, caught on national TV right there. When I first started working with Corporate Visions, three and a half years ago, I had an opportunity to uh, work with the very first company I worked with. It was a company called Interwise. And Interwise were paying engaged Corporate Visions to do a four-day messaging, four-day story creation event. At the very front end of that event, they had a one-hour Gartner conference call set up, and they invited Corporate Visions to be a part of it. About 35 minutes into the call with a Gartner analyst, where the Interwise executives were telling Gartner how great they were and how good they were and why they were going to take over the world, the Gartner analysts interrupted them and said, okay, fellas, uh, stop, we've heard enough. Uh, here's our recommendation. Uh, we suggest that you get as much revenue into your company in the next six months as you possibly can and then sell. Get out. Because we believe that within the next year to 18 months, you're going to be crushed by your competition. We don't see anything unique about your company. We don't see anything different about your company, and you're going to be out of business. That's the message you got on the front end of when you're going to de de deliver a new message, create a new message of how great you are. Well, to the credit of the Interwise executives, they went ahead with that message creation event. 180 days later, after Ghana analysts told them, get out sell your company, you're not going to be around anymore. 180 days later, at a Gartner trade show, Interwise was receiving an award from Gartner for best new technology in show. <coughs> now what happened? What happened in that 180 days? What was different? The executives didn't change. The senior, executive, the senior leadership team didn't change. The sales reps didn't change. The product certainly didn't change. What changed? Their story. Their story changed, and their ability to go out and deliver that story to their customers with such passion, with such confidence, with such conviction, in a way that they were able to connect with their buyers, to help those buyers understand exactly why they should choose Interwise. 180 days later, that's the power of story. How many of you believe that you work for the best company in your industry. Let's see those hands. Every hand should be up, shouldn't they? How many of you believe that you work for the best company? I can say in your industry, but you can say just the best company. How many of you believe that you work for the best company? Let's see those hands. All right, good. So that means that you win every single deal that you go out on, right? Your DMs, they win every single deal that they go out and, and position against a guy that they go out and sell. Doesn't happen, does it? Why is that? Well, because sometimes you just plain get outsold. It's called a spade to spade. What happens in that situation? Someone tells a better story. You're in a story war every single day. Your sales reps are in a story war every single day. And it doesn't matter whether they're on the phone with a customer, whether they're sending them an email, whether they're out there and you're by their side in front of them, in, in, in person, in front of that client. You're in a story war. In sales and business, you've seen this over and over and over again. VHS versus beta. Beta, a far superior technological product. VHS, a better story. Word perfect versus Word. Word perfect, not around anymore. Word, Microsoft told a better story. OS2, Windows. Microsoft told a better story. Who, what company has 80% of the handheld uh, iPod market? Gave it away, didn't I? <laughs> How about that? Apple, right? Apple, they have 80% of, uh, of the digital player market. Uh, do they have the most superior product? If you look at them feature to feature, no they don't. They don't have the most features, they don't have the, the most capability, but what have they told? They've told a phenomenal story. That's a company that knows how to connect with its buyers, a company that knows how to tell a great story to get people to buy. 
So what is the ADP story? Let's take a look at a slide that many of you are familiar with. Does this look familiar? You track one because it's an old slide. You don't use it before uh, today, right? It's one that you used to use a long time. Uh, maybe it's one that uh, your sales reps, your DMs, still use when they're out in the field. Uh, this has got some fantastic information on it, doesn't it? Uh, did you know that you have over 550,000 clients? Uh, you're at seven million dollars and heading north. By the way, great position to be in. Uh, one in every six uh, employees uh, in the United States is paid by ADP. 32 million worldwide. Fantastic information. But what's the challenge around it? Robert McGee, this is a man who knows how to tell a story. Robert McGee, he wrote a book. And that book is called Story. This man is one of the greatest screenwriters from Hollywood. This man travels around the world telling other screenwriters how to connect with their customers, how to connect with their audience, how to write great movies. And Robert McGee said, oh, what are some of the movies that these proteges have written? Movies like Sleepless in Seattle, Aaron Brockovich, uh, Forrest Gump, Gandhi, just a few good ones, right? Uh, this is a man who knows how to connect with his audience. And he says you can do it in two ways. The first way that you can connect with your audience, and oh, by the way, the most challenging way, is through delivering facts and figures. 550,000 customers. One in six AAA rated companies. One in six people around the United States are uh, paid by ADP, 32 million. The most challenging way is to deliver it through facts and figures. Through rhetoric. Why? Because when you're delivering this information, what do you think your customers are doing? Well, according to Robert McGee and a number of other professionals in the field, they say that your customers are arguing with you. They're debating it with you. They're, they're challenging, they're criticizing, they're evaluating. If they're not doing it openly, then what do you think they're doing it? Right up here in their head, they're doing it silently. But they are doing it. Why? Because they have their own facts and figures, they have their own research, they have their own information, and they're debating it and, and evaluating your information against theirs. And now, does it mean that this information is no good? Well, there's some fantastic information up on this slide. There's some great information up here. The challenge with it uh, is that facts and figures don't motivate people to take action. How many of you, when your DMs show this slide, your buyer says, oh, I'll take two. And it, that'd be a great way to sell, wouldn't it? But it doesn't happen that way. It simply doesn't happen that way. Okay, so what's the second challenge around this particular slide? So this slide, this is what I call a resonant slide. There's times when, uh, when I'm meeting new people, I'll often ask them a simple question. Hey, what's your story? And they'll say, well, I, you know, I've been in the payroll business for 27 years, um, and boom, 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 and I, and I stop and I go, no, 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 no. That's, you've got a great resume there, a very impressive resume. But watch your story. And they start to get a sense that you're looking for something a little deeper, a little more significant. This is a great resume slide. And what do facts and figures give you? What does rhetoric give you? Well, this type of facts and figures give, this is great for credentialing, isn't it? You use this for credentialing. Great credentials. And that gives you credibility, which allows your customers to believe you. But it does not inspire them to take action. And that's what you're looking for. You're trying to get your customers to, to, to buy from you. You're trying to make a better connection with them faster and sooner. That's the wrong way to do it. Okay, so the second challenge around information like this is that it gets lost in translation and Cindy alluded to that in her introduction. What do you mean by that? Well, think about when you first started working with ADP. And for some of you, that's a long time ago, isn't it? A long time ago. How many people have uh, been with ADP over five years? Let's see hands. Okay, 10 years. You best hands up. 15 years. 20 years. Stand up if you've been with a company over 25 years. Stand up. Let's see how many people in this room have been with a company over 25 years. That's phenomenal. Give me a hand. What's significant about that? What's important about that? 
let's tie it back to, to, to uh, the importance of uh, ADP story. How important is your story? Uh, what sort of things are wrapped up in the ADP story? Things like your heritage. Over 58 years in the industry, right? Uh, so it's your heritage. It's your future, your vision. Where you are today and where you're headed. One ADP. The fact that you're willing to go out and acquire companies to get new technologies, to get new products. Why? Because your customers are asking for them. You're, you're, you're a customer focused, you're a customer centric organization. Uh, it's your story, the ADP story, is how you attract great companies. Why is it that any one of your customers can wake up in the morning and say, hmm, don't want to be with ADP today. Got to go over to Paychex. Hmm, don't want to be with ADP today. Got to go over to Kronos. They can do that, can't they? No contracts. At any time, they can wake up and say, I'm going to go over to the competition, and yet, how many years, on average, do you keep clients, uh, do you keep your customers? What is it? 10, 12 years, right? Keep your customers without contracts. Why? Because your customers believe in your story. It's how you attract great employees. It's why you're sitting in the seat you are today. Why? Because you believe in a new story. You may never have thought about it that way. You could work for any company you want in America, and yet you choose ADP. And oh, by the way, you're doing a, a, a wonderful job, and, and you're going to have great focus on it this year to reduce it. You're reducing your churn, you're reducing your turnover. And what are you doing? You're helping convince your DMs and those people that report to you. You're helping show them how great a, a company this is and how wonderful a story that you have. And that's why you're helping reduce that churn. And when you get your new story that you're going to get today, a story that is so radically different than you have ever seen before, a story that's going to be delivered in a way that you've never seen delivered here at ADP before, a story that's not about ADP, but is the focus on your customers, you're going to be able to cut that churn out even more. Because your DMs are going to get excited about what you get to preview and try on, like a suit jacket today. So let's come back to, boy, I went a whoo, big swing. Let's come back to Lost in Translation. What do I mean by Lost in Translation? Well, as I mentioned, Sydney alluded, Sydney alluded to it, right? Um, you think about your, new, your DMs when they come in and they, they learn a ton of information about your company. They learn a ton of information about the industry. All of the tax regulations, all of the legalese, uh, they learn tons of information about your product. So when they get out in the field, what do you think they want to talk about? Everything that they learned, right? Think back to power messaging. That, that little thing that's sitting on top of your head, right? In your head, the brain. Uh, when you get out in front, when your DMs get out in front of your customer, hey, even for some of you when you get out in front of your customer, uh, the old brain fires like a piston, right? It's, why not like a Christmas tree? Why? Because who's well don't you understand as well? Customers well. So what do you want to deliver? Well, you want to deliver all the information that you know really well, that you feel comfortable with. And for your DMs, that's a lot of product. And unfortunately for your customer, you, you saw this morning what happens in the cockpit, right? How you have to clear the vision. You've got to get rid of all of the noise. And you've got to be focused. Well, not only do you have to do that, but your customers have to. They've, they've got a lot of noise going on in their business, right? They don't care about the world of product. What do they care about? They care about running a successful company. That's what they care about. And so when you don't tell them what's unique and what's different and why they should buy from ADP and you leave it up to them, well, that information gets lost in all of the white noise in their figurative cockpit. And it gets lost in translation. How many of you have young kids? Young kids? Okay. My wife and I have uh, two kids. We adopted them from Russia four years ago. Jackson and Jordan, they're five years old. Little kids. Good thing that they were not born to us. They're a lot cuter than if they were born to my wife and I. My wife is really cute, but hey, this June, there's nothing you can do about it. So little kids. I love, now I travel a lot in my job. I love it when I, when I go home and I have an opportunity to sit in my kids from school. Because uh, I just love watching them and interact with, with the other kids, with the teacher. 
One thing that I love about seeing in the preschool class is when the teacher asks for volunteers. Because what do kids do? How do they respond? Oh, choose me, choose me, 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 me. They don't care what they look like, they don't care how they, they just want to be chosen, right? How many, I'm just thinking, my way multiplied by, I'm just trying to think of the PSI that just landed on that stage there. I don't want to go there, let me tell you, 10 times whatever the number is, and, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. Just stand in front of a Mack truck, you'll get a feel for what it's like on this. Okay, so little kids, they, they, they're all enthusiastic, they volunteer. As kids get older, in, in a high school, what happens? Teacher asks for, for volunteers, what happens? Yeah, it's really hard, right? They're concerned about peer pressure, they're concerned about what they look like. And heaven forbid, you ask an adult, for a volunteer, right? What does everyone do? Hand out. Until John or Susie or Jill at the back bravely put their hand up and everyone breathes a collective sigh of relief. Oh, thank God we can look up again, okay? I was, I was down in, in Australia with my family in February. Went down, took the kids down to see Grandma and Grandpa with the nieces and, and uncles and aunts. And I was talking with my sister about my seven-year-old niece, Iris. Iris, a beautiful little girl, very smart, very intelligent, very creative. And my sister was telling me about last year when, uh, when Iris was in school, her teacher, as part of our art assignment, or homework assignment, had asked her to go home and draw a tree. That's all she gave. Go home and draw a tree. And then bring it back tomorrow and show everybody. So Iris came home and spent a lot of time drawing this tree. So next day at dinner, my sister said, so Iris, what did your teacher say about your tree? What was the feedback about your tree? And I was, wasn't given a lot of information there. And then Veronica realized, something's going on here. This is not right. And as she dug down a little deeper, she found out that I just didn't show the teacher her tree. Why is that? Well, Iris, when she was watching everyone else show pictures of their tree, well, what did those trees look like? Well, they looked something like this. You've all seen this tree before, right? The famous lollipop tree. You may have uh, drawn it when you were younger, certainly your kids have drawn it. It's the first tree you draw, right? The famous lollipop tree. And all the other kids have drawn a tree that looked pretty similar to that. What did Iris' tree look like? Well, it was winter in Australia. All the leaves had fallen off the tree. And Iris' tree looked something like this. But because the tree was so different, she didn't want to show her tree because it was different than all the other kids. You know, isn't it amazing how, at such an early age, kids realize that different is not good. That uniqueness is not good. And they do everything they can. I'm already starting to see with my daughter at five years old. They, they work overtime to try and blend in, to try and, and not be different from everybody else, to try and wear the same clothes, to try and say the same things, to try and look the same. They work hard at it, don't they? You know what, in sales and in business, differentiation and uniqueness is everything. Differentiation and uniqueness is your competitive advantage. And if you don't tell your customers what's unique and different about you, then who do you leave it up to? Well, best you leave it up to them, but worst you leave it up to your competition. But if you think back to power messaging and decision dynamics within human beings, you will not, your customers will not make a decision unless they understand what's different about something. Remember the example on the web course that you've gone through one or two times? Chuck Laughlin, the founder of uh, Corporate Visions, was saying when he was down in Virginia, the big market of icebreakers, right? The blue icebreakers, and everyone kept choosing the red icebreaker out of the middle. Why? Because it was different. It was unique. You cannot make a decision. Human beings will not make a decision. And unless they understand what's unique and different about something. And, and you have to show your customers that you're unique and different. You have to tell them. You can't leave it up to them. Otherwise, the information gets lost in translation. What else is? Again, not that the information on, on here is, is bad, but what else is the challenge around this slide? Who is this slide all about? Who is, who's this information on this slide all about? It's about you, isn't it? It's about you. And who should be the central character, the focus of your sales calls? 
The buyer, that's right. It's inside out, it's back to front, isn't it? This information is all about you and, and, and it needs to be about the customer, it needs to be about the, the buyer. It's back to front, inside out versus outside in. What do I mean by that? Well, the focus is on you first and, and the customer second. In the world of sales, in the message that you're going to see that this afternoon, that's different. It's radically different. Because you're, you're, you're going from a transition, moving from inside out to outside looking in. Making your customer the hero of the sales, or making your customer the hero of the experience. And you, what are you playing? You're playing a very important secondary role. But it's your customer that's the hero. How does this get translated inside out versus outside in? Uh, your, your DMs are out on the sales call and you hear something like this. And Mr. Customer, last time we came in, you told us that you had some problems. Because you phrased it, right? So you told us that you had some problems. Uh, your, your business, woo, it stinks. You've got yourself in a world of hurt here, my friends. And your, your business is falling down. You wouldn't say that, but you know, little license here. It's, it's coming apart at the seams. Well, ADP has been able to help company after company after company. Uh, we've been able to do this for them. We've been able to do that for them. We've been able to do something else for them. And, and take a look at all of these referrals that you can look to. That's inside out because that communication is all about who. Why? As opposed to, you know, Mr. Customer, you're working hard in your business. You've got a lot of challenges. And you're doing the very best that you can to get around those challenges. But, boy, time is against your side. Growth is against your side. You know, companies are coming to ADP, why? Other companies are, are experiencing similar challenges to you, and they come to ADP, boom, and you're telling your story. Now that's from outside in. Think back seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. How, how did you sell? Well, feature function, right? That most of us sold feature function benefit. That's, that's how we sold. Uh, and you made a transition. You started to walk down the path of moving more outside in by value-based selling. Right? I had an opportunity to take a look at the value-based playbook. Man, this is some great information in here. Ton of, of information. Someone, lots of people, I'm guessing, spend an incredible amount of time putting this together so that you could elevate those conversations out of feature function up into value, talk value, have value-based conversations. But if you look at the information in this book, who is it all about? It's still about ADP. <laughs> It's still the focus is AEP. Like I mentioned before, today, you are going to receive a message in such a way that you've never received it before. It's going to be in a different way, a unique way, a compelling way that, that you've never experienced it before. And it's your competitive advantage. It is going to change the playing field for you. I mean, you're already doing an incredible job. You're already the biggest in the industry. And now you get a new story, and it's like, just the next ramp. It's, it's an unfair competitive advantage that you're going to have. That's pretty exciting. Okay. You know, there, there is a, a disconnect between the, the, the two face, between, uh, between sales and marketing. What happens? Well, you get a lot of your information, your support information from marketing. And this is not just a disconnect that happens at ADP. It's a disconnect that happens between sales and marketing organizations around the world. Marketing lives in what world? Well, they live in the world of the written word. That's what they, they, they're phenomenal at kicking out great information on the website, great product materials, great marketing materials, um, uh, PowerPoint presentations that support you. Phenomenal, but it's in the written word. The written world. What world do you live in? The spoken world, don't you? The spoken word. And they make a one-to-one -one translation, right? It doesn't work that way. It's tough to take the written word and turn it into something meaningful. In fact, the Aberdeen Group, who is a consulting company out of Boston, they focus on sales and marketing verticals, and they did a study, and they came up with some fantastic information, incredible information. The average sales rep spends between 40 to 60 hours a month. The average GM, let's put it in your world, could spend up to 40 to 60 hours a month doing what? Recreating, often very, very badly, the great information that you receive from marketing. Why do they do that? 
Well, because they're trying to put it in a more meaningful way, in a way that can help them make a better connection with their buyer. Uh, take that information that, that they feel good about delivering and make a stronger connection with their buyer. And they do it really bad in terms of translating that information. Now think about it on your teams. How many DMs do you each have on your team? Just think about it to yourself for a minute. Multiply that by, let's say 40, oh, that's even way too much. Let's say 20 hours. Every member on your team spends 20 hours a month recreating, often very badly, the marketing they get, the information they get from marketing. How much lost productivity just on your team alone does that translate into? Now multiply that by the number of sales reps they have in the organization, and I've got to tell you, that 10% increase that you have to eat next year is starting to look a whole lot more realistic, isn't it? 70%, another statistic that the Aberdeen Group came up with, that 70% of your company's brand is not communicated through collateral, is not communicated through things that you leave behind. 70% of your brand is communicated at the field level by your field sales organization. And if you, depending on what study you look at, this is the Aberdeen Group, but depending on other studies, it can go up as high as 83%. Now you start to get to appreciate why it's so important to have a consistent story. Imagine that if I, if, today, if I was to go around the room and ask everyone, hey, what's the ADP story? How many versions of it do you think I'd get? I think I'd get about 200 plus. Why is that? Because everyone has their own version of the ADP story, right? And you're all right. Every one of you is right because it's your version. And you're proud of your version. But what does that create in the field? Well, that creates message schizophrenia. And, and, and if you, that creates confusion in the marketplace to your buyers. Every time you talk to someone from ADP, they, they deliver a different message. Man, this company doesn't know who they are. But when you have everyone, imagine having everyone, from your CEO, through your executive management team, through the leadership team, through your operations department, your marketing department, your sales department, feet on the street, all saying the same thing. Not delivering it in exactly the same way. That's why you went through power messaging, to deliver it in a unique way, unique that's, that the, that's meaningful to you, but you're delivering the same message. Look what it did for Innowise, a company that was gonna be crushed by its competition. You're an industry leader. You've already got momentum. Now throw on a new story, and it's like throwing a supercharger on top of your business. Maybe that increase needs to be 12 percent next year. Okay. Oh shh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to give you a quote. So what's the power of the spoken word? Why is your marketing department give them credit and, and, and for the recognition that, hey, we can deliver a message that's gonna be different, that's gonna be unique, and they've got behind and helped driven this, so they're not picking it out in the same old way that messages have been picked out before. They're supporting this is unique and different, and this is gonna have a huge impact on our business, and we're gonna deliver it through the spoken word this time. Why the spoken word? What's powerful about the spoken word? Well, one, as you learn from power messaging, how much, mess how much of your uh, message gets delivered through your voice, through your words? Anyone remember? 7%, yeah, 7%. 93% of your message gets delivered at the unconscious level um, through your body and through your voice. When, when, when someone is excited about what they have to say, when you're excited, when your DMs get excited about the message, do you see it in people's eyes? You see their eyes glisten, they sparkle, they're excited. You hear the enthusiasm in their voice. You see it in their body. There's conviction, commitment. And man, when your customer sees that, they get wrapped up in it. On July 6, 2005, five cities were gathered in London, England. It was their opportunity to make a presentation on why they should be, why they should be chosen as the city to host the 2012 Olympics. Now you can imagine what those presentations were like with high-tech, high-multimedia presentations. 
And it was their opportunity to show the International Olympic Committee why us, why us is to, to be the host city for the 2012 Olympics. Uh, if you remember back in London, was the underdog. They were the dark horse in this race by far. They happened to be the fourth city that was presenting out of these five cities. Sebastian Coe, an Olympic medalist, was the one who was presenting. And during the presentation, Sebastian Coe paused as if breaking from a script and delivered the following scenario. When I was 12 years old, I remember reaching across the room and slapping a portable television to clear the reception from the 1980 Olympics that were being broadcast from Moscow. And it was at that very early age, that very tender age of 12 years old, that I realized that this is what I wanted to do for my country. And as they say, the rest is history. I went on to win two Olympic gold medals. The Olympics changes lives. And it is this life-changing experience that London seeks to bring and extend to the rest of the world. To say that you could hear a pin drop at that point is a gross understatement. The room was riveted. He had caught them up emotionally in his very short story. Sebastian Cole, through the conviction that he, the way in which he delivered that message, the conviction he had in that story, he made a connection with that International Olympic Committee like no other city was able to do. They say that the Olympics, whatever city was awarded the Olympics, it'll be worth about $11 billion in revenue to that city. Sebastian Cole, through the spoken word, through the conviction, the commitment, the passion in delivering a short story, just one London and $11 billion deal. In power messaging, you heard that as key. That's conviction, right? When you have great key. And when you've got a great story that makes a connection with your buyer like none of your competitors will be able to, you can go out and you can deliver that with conviction and with passion and commitment. And so will your PMs. And you'll make a different connection than you've ever made before. Your DMs will make a different connection, and, and it'll help your customer understand why they should buy from you, and it'll speed up those sales cycles. Robert McGee, I mentioned Robert McGee in the, in the book story. I said that there were two ways that you can make a connection. The first and most challenging is through facts and figures. The second, Robert McGee says, is to unite an idea with an emotion. How many of you believe that there are millions of people dying around the world from hunger. And so when you see the UNICEF logo, right, and we know that UNICEF is an organization that helps, humanitarian organization helping people around the world. When you see that blue UNICEF logo, what do you do? Well, you reach into your pocket and you hand them over 50 bucks, don't you? No, you don't. You know intellectually, you read all the facts and the figures, you know all the rhetoric that people are dying around the world. And yet when you hear that idea, those facts and figures, it doesn't inspire you to take action. It doesn't drive you to take action. UNICEF knows this. That's why when you see ads on TV or pictures in magazines, what do you see? You see pictures of kids in, in impoverished with, with, in, in, that, that look like they're going to die, right? You see them with their, their mothers um, and, and, and they, these gaunt looks on their faces. And then what do you see next to it? This happy kid. Why? Because you've given money. What do they do? They unite the idea that, hey, people are dying. With an emotion. What's the, what's the emotion? You're, you're being charitable. You're not wanting to see people die. You having, being a hum humanitarian and, and having feelings and emotions for these people. That's how they get you to take action. So Robert McGee says, hey, with your business story, you need to unite an idea with an emotion. That's not new. You've heard from how much you need to make an emotional connection. Uh, one of the best books that I believe, and this is just my personal opinion, one of the best books that have been, that's been written about messaging in the last couple of years is a book called Make Step. It's a book by Chip and Dan Heath, two brothers. Chip and Dan Heath did a study. They said, hey, why is it that some, some messages, some stories are more memorable than others? 
What makes these messages more memorable? What makes them stick in people's minds over other messages that aren't as memorable? Do you want your message to stick with your customers? You bet you do. Do you want to be able to connect with them in a way like you've never connected before so that they know why ADP and they know why sooner? Well, absolutely, of course you do. Well, let's take a look at some of the criteria that Dan and Chip Heath have identified that makes messages stickier, that will help you make a better connection with your buyer. They state it in a slightly different way. They say that if you want people to take action, you've got to get them to care. And the way that you get them to care is to connect, to connect with them at an emotional level. You want people to take action? then you've got to make them care. And in order to make them care, you connect with them at an emotional level. So what are some of the criteria around making messages stick? The first one is that your message needs to be simple. Folklore says that when Napoleon was going out to war, he would gather all of his generals together in the army. And uh, all of his army generals together, I'm sorry, in a tent. And they would map out the strategy for the next battle. And then he would send him out of the tent and he would turn to a foot soldier who he had off in the corner polishing his boots. And he would ask the foot soldier, hey, what's the battle strategy? And that foot soldier had to tell him word for word what the strategy was going to be. Why did he do that? Because that's the way that the battle plans would be carried out to the front line, right? And if a foot soldier, if they were too complex and, and not understandable and a foot soldier couldn't get it right, then there's no way in the world that would ever be able to be carried out to the front line without creating confusion. And Napoleon would lose his wars. He lost them for other reasons. You know that through history, but he didn't lose it because he didn't have the, the, the messages weren't simple enough. Stephen Denning, he's a, a world-renowned writer on the power of stories in business. Stephen Denning says, hey, your messages need to be simple. Like, your stories need to be simple. They need to be to the point. They need to be relevant to your customers. Why? Because complex things confuse. It, it leads back to lost in translation. You need to have a simple message, a concise message. And that's what you're going to see this afternoon in the new message that you receive. What else? There needs to be something unexpected in the way that you deliver the message. Something unexpected in either the message itself or in the way that the message is delivered. On September 5th, 2005, Eric Weyenmeyer stood atop Mount Kosciuszko, the highest mountain in Australia, and at that point had achieved a seven-year goal that he set for himself. His goal was to climb the seven summits, the highest peaks, the highest mountains on each of the seven continents. And in so doing, as he stood atop Mount Kosciuszko in Australia, he joined a hundred elite other climbers. Only a hundred other people had ever accomplished this task before him. Just one year earlier, he had stood atop the highest peak in the world. Mount Everest. And at 33 years of age, he was the youngest climber ever to have accomplished all of these tasks. Oh, by the way, Eric Weyenmeyer was the first and only blind man to ever accomplish all of these tasks. You see, Eric lost his sight when he was 13 years old. But that didn't stop him. That didn't keep him in his bedroom at home. No, he went out and he became an accomplished skier. He went out and he became an accomplished rock climber. He became an accomplished mountaineer. And Eric Weyermeyer has received awards for his humanitarian efforts as well as his athletic prowess. This blind man has inspired people around the world. And when you hear that he did a blind, it makes you feel like you've got to go out and find the so-called fusion or something, that's the, what have you been doing with it all? This guy did this blind? It was a great story in and of itself, but when you find out that he did it as a blind man, wow! And unless you knew the Eric Wainwright story, I guess you weren't expecting that. What can you do that's unexpected when you go out in front of your customers? Well, you know what? Most of your competition, what do they do? They go out and they open up that, how much like it? 
uh, computer and they pull up that PowerPoint slide deck and boom, they want you to make a presentation. And what does that first slide look like? Well, I don't want to click back to it, but you've got the visual in there, don't you? All of the facts and figures, all of the rhetoric. That's what their first slide looks like. But when you go out there and you focus on your customer, and you focus on their challenges and their issues, you focus on helping them grow their business, that's a little unexpected. They're not expecting to see that. You use some of those power messaging techniques that obviously from this morning you heard are already being used, and you use more of them, that's unexpected. For those of you that are using you see the power of those messaging techniques. Oh, by the way, they're, they're not CBI. Stop referring to them as CBI techniques. They're your techniques. They're power messaging techniques. You've taken ownership of them. And it's changing the way that you win deals. It's helping you make, make a better connection with your buyer. It's helping them choose you sooner. That's unexpected that a blind man is sitting on top of Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world. What are some of the other criteria? Este é o crânio igual ao crânio de qualquer motociclista. Este é o capacete de... I have it myself just a little bit. What does it tie to? It ties to contrast. You learn in power messaging how important it is to have contrast. What's the only way that you can show value to your customers in what you do day to day? The only way you can do it is by contrasting. And in power messaging, you learn contrasting the pains and challenges and issues of today with what they're going to get from ADP and how it's going to change their world. It's the only way you can show value is to show contrast. You also need to make that emotional connection. You know that when you connect with your buyers at an emotional level, what happens to the sales cycle? What happens to their decisions? Anyone? Do they slow down? No, when you make an emotional connection with your buyer, it speeds up. You see this in your personal life all the time. You get wrapped up in that new car, that new house that you're buying, boom, you make a faster decision. And you tend to spend more money when you do it. <laughs> You want to make a connection with your body, you have to make it, you have to make an emotional connection with them. You want to make a, a different and unique connection with them, you've got to connect with them. Got it. Is that a, a word in the English or did I just make that up? Got it. That's really good. You have to connect with them at an emotional level. Okay. The last one. The last criteria that Chan and, uh, Dan and Chippy have identified as being critical to making messages stick. Now, You've been hearing about your business story, your corporate story. Let's just take a look at stories in general. Why are stories so powerful? Why are they so effective? Because you're hardwired to respond positively to stories. You have, everyone was telling stories, having a great time. When you like people, you communicate with stories. So what they found is if you can get a computer to respond with a story, then a human, uh, and, and interact with stories, then the person on the other end of the phone can't tell it's a computer. And they are this close, this close to making it a reality. It's pretty scary, isn't it? When if they just followed the ADP's model, they wouldn't have had to spend those hundreds of millions of dollars in research, and you just have the person pick up the phone and tell you a story, right, within 20 seconds. That's not a bad idea either. When don't you tell stories? When you don't like somebody, okay, let's go on a little journey. Think about the one person in your life you don't like, okay? The one person that you don't like, your nemesis. If they came up to you and asked you a question, you don't sit there for 20 minutes and tell them a story, do you? What do you do? You give them the facts, you stop communicating, and you move on. Your, your conversation becomes very transactional. Hmm. When have you ever seen someone be transactional in their communication? Hmm. When you get out, the only time, one of the only times you see people transactional, when they're not communicating with someone that they don't like, is when they get out in front of the person that they need to persuade and influence the most. The customer. 
And what happens? Open up the PowerPoint slide deck and start giving all of the facts and figures. When you do that, you treat your customer like you, like you treat someone you don't like. Because if you really like them, you'd share stories with them. You'd help them understand how you can make a difference in their world, how their world can be different through stories. Which is why customer stories are so powerful. Why they make a difference for you in how you sell. So what's your role? What's your role in, oh, by the way, when you, when you wrap it all together, you might have already seen it. What does it lead to? Hey, at least it's success. You're gonna have success. There's a corporate visions alumnus, his name is Bryce. He, he goes to uh, Power Messaging uh, year after year after year. He could teach the course. You ask him, hey Bryce, uh, what do you do? He doesn't say, I'm a salesperson. He says, I'm a storyteller. He's a very well paid storyteller. This man makes seven figures. And has made seven figures for the last seven years. And he attributes it to telling stories. All I do is I go out there, I tell them a story, I let them make their own connection. I let them put it together. All I do is tell stories. He says, if you want people to be more successful, tell them to tell them more stories. Because the two are inextricably linked. So what does this mean for you? What's your role in all of this? What impact are you going to have for your DMs when you leave this event and you get your new message? What impact are you going to have on ADP to be able to hit that 10% increase next year? How are you going to impact the organization? How are you going to impact those people that are looking to you as leaders, that are looking to you for guidance, looking to you for mentors? Well, you could leave this event and you could just tell them what the new story is. Don't. Model it for them. Take ownership of it. And that's what you're going to have a chance to do this afternoon, right? But you need to model it for them. You need to be living examples of what that story is, is going to be. Ha anyone remember in 2001 from messaging how much Tiger Woods made? His winnings in 2001. Do you remember how much money he made in 2001 on the PGA Tour? $4.5 million. $4.5 million was the winnings. And remember uh, the winnings. And how much did everyone else make the average earnings from everyone else? $450,000, right? And then what was the difference between them? There was a 5% stroke differential, right, between Tiger Woods and everybody else. A 5% stroke differential, tenfold in winnings. You know, Tiger Woods could have sat back and said, boy, I'm doing pretty good. I've got a tenfold increase. I could take my foot off the pedal. But he didn't. He went out and he had LASIK eye surgery. Why is that? Because when he was coming down the 17th fairway, when the 18th fairway, the sweat was rolling down his eyes and blocking his vision, his contacts, making them cloudy. The wind was drying out his contacts. The sand, when he was in a bunker, was getting in his eyes. And he felt like that when he needed to be at his best, he wasn't. He didn't have the clarity of vision. So he went out and put his career in jeopardy and went and had laser eye surgery. Well, what impact did that have on him? Well, in 2006, the end of the saga, right? How much money did he make in 2006? Tiger Woods made $9.9 .9 million in career winnings just on the PGA Tour in 2006. How much did everyone else make? What were the average earnings? $950,000. Everyone else got better. But who else got better? Tiger Woods. Do you know how frustrating that must be for BJC? for Phil Mickelson, for Ernie Els, to know that they're out there, he's the, he's the guy in, the, in their crosshairs when he gets up, when they get up in the morning, all they're thinking about is how do I beat Tiger Woods, and he's still tenfold better than him. Oh, you know what the difference was in 2006? It wasn't a 5% stroke differential. It was a 4% stroke differential. Tiger Woods could have taken his foot off the pedal, but he didn't. Why? Because good enough wasn't great enough for Tiger Woods. Seth Godin says that he's one of the most successful internet marketers on the web. He says you can't be good enough anymore. You can't be great. All companies are good. All companies say that they're great. You have to be better than that. You have to be remarkable. And what does, by definition, remarkable means that someone remarks about how great you are. And it's not you remarking about how great you are, it's someone else remarking. You have to be remarkable. You know when Paychex and Ceridian and Kronos and Ultimate get up in the morning, who do you think is in their crosshairs? You are. You're the ones they're gunning for. 
You're two to three times as big as any of those companies. You could take your foot off the pedal just a little bit. But good enough can't be great enough. Great enough can't be good enough for you. You have to be remarkable. And you've got a big nut to hit next year. How are you going to hit it? Well, you don't have to go out and get, get lazy guy surgery. You don't have to go out and put your career in jeopardy. You do need to go out and tell a better story. One of the greatest movie producers in the world is a man by the name of Steven Spielberg. What does Steven Spielberg say? Once the hard work of research and writing is done, once the roles are cast, once the crucial question of what is this movie about has been asked and answered, there comes the most urgent question of all. How will I tell this story? Well, folks, the hard work has been done. The roles are being cast. You're in them. The, the, the writing, the research has been done, and you're about to get a message like I've been saying that you've never seen before, in a way that's never been delivered for, in a way that's going to be compelling to make a difference in your marketplace, that's going to help, make a, help give you a better connection with your buyer. The only question that remains is, how are you going to tell this story? Now I'm back to you last time. Great job, Mike. Thank you. Well, if you now feel that the importance of story is important as we go out into the field and try to connect with our buyers, stand up. All right. Feels good to stand and stretch a little bit, too. 